All right. Good afternoon and welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar this afternoon on core financial basics, building your programs for financial success. My name is Meg Beyer. I'm part of the Managed Care Technical Assistance Center team, and I'm joined by a host of our partners who will be walking us through the materials today for our presentation. Just a few logistics um, before we get started. Today's presentation is going to be recorded, and the recording and the slides will be available afterwards. It usually takes our system about a day or so for the recording to be available, um, but you'll be able to find all of the resources on the MCTAC website. So if you're not familiar with it, um, MCTAC.org is where you can find a lot of the information, um, and you'll be able to find the slides and the recording directly there. I want to thank our partners who helped us develop this. Um, David will be introducing himself. Chris, I invite you to introduce yourself also. Um, and we're very thankful that we get to work with our partners at CCSI and IAPERS on these, pres on these presentations and offerings. For those of you who might not be familiar, um, we do have a whole host of offerings that are part of what we call our core implementation series or bundle of offerings. So this is our first live webinar um, today. We have some webinars coming up in May. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about those at the end of the presentation. You can visit the MCTAC website to register for them. But we just want to encourage you to sign up for the MCTAC listserv if you haven't already. You can do so by visiting our website. There's information on how to sign up for the listserv there. Um, or you can email us at mictac.info at nyu.edu, and we'll register you. And also, if you're on the webinar today, you're likely going to get added to the MCTAC listserv just so that you can access the resources, um, the recording, and the slides from today's webinar. So we just want to remind everybody that today's webinar is not a one-off. Um, it's part of a larger series of webinars and resources. There will be some resources that will be announced later this spring towards June that are related to um, a financial calculator tool and a companion guide that will help organizations and understand how to best implement CORE um, and really in a successful way. So I want to thank everybody for joining and thank you, um, Christian. I'm sorry if my audio isn't great. I have an old headset, so I'm doing the best I can, but thank you. I'll try and adjust. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that not only do we have these live webinars and tools and resources that are coming out, but also we have some pre-recorded webinars that are already available on the MCTAC website. So if you visit the MCTAC website and go to the core implementation page, you can find a whole set of pre-recorded webinars that are really created for different provider types to understand how CORE can really support individuals in their pathway to recovery. Um, and I want to thank my colleague Nadej, who just chatted out the link to the pre-recorded webinars in the chat box. And then finally today, just like Nadej and Christian are chatting and utilizing the chat box, we are encouraging you to chat in your questions throughout the webinar. Um, Chris is going to be monitoring the chat box. And if there are questions that are particular to a slide that David is covering, we're going to try and pause David <laughs> and address the question. Um, but if there are more general questions, we do have time at the end to address them. So we want to thank you again for joining us. And thanks to our, our partners for pulling this webinar together for us today. So with that, David, do you want to take it away? Sure. Uh, thank you, Meg. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon. As you can see, my name is David Warsnick. I am the Senior Director for Fiscal Practice Improvement at Coordinated Care Services Incorporated, or CCSI. As Meg had said, I'm joined by uh, my colleague, uh, Chris Copeland, this afternoon. Uh, Chris will be monitoring your chat questions and will help us with any questions that are left unanswered at the end. Chris, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Sure, Chris Copeland. I'm uh, Senior Director of uh, Consulting Services at CCSI as well and uh, work with David um, on the financial side here, trying to think about how to operationalize some of this work. So uh, I'll be meeting you all later on as we go through the fiscal modeling tool that David in, um, uh, David uh, um, um, 
uh, mentioned earlier on. So um, welcome everybody and I look forward to um, monitoring the questions. Okay, thanks Chris. So let's talk a little bit about the objectives for today. So we've been, Chris mentioned, Meg mentioned that, that we have an Excel-based fiscal model. Uh, we do a lot of modeling for different types of programs, clinic programs, CFDSS programs, uh, crisis stabilization, mobile crisis outreach. And really what these models are designed to do is to help people really hone in on not only some of the key business practices, but what are the cost and revenue drivers that there are the primary financial underpinning of different types of program. And these, in this one, we're gonna be talking about the core service program. And what I'm trying to try to, to help is, uh, folks understand is what are the financial or the foundational building blocks? What should you be thinking about? What information do you, are you going to need to structure in your programs in a way that are going to be financially sustainable. And so what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be walking through, first of all, a general level set about the core services. I'll be honing in on, on some of the specific differences between the services. We'll go through and, and take a look at revenue drivers, expense drivers, staffing, and then there'll be that time at the end for some questions. So let's go through some things I'm sure you're already aware of. So, you know, what is what is CORE, the Community Oriented Recovery and Empowerment Services? We're replacing for adult health HCBS services. Um, they're going to, we're going to, use our clinicians and rehab practitioners to support eligibility in the intake process. Um, eligibility is HARP and Rollies, HARP and HARP eligible HIV, SNP enrollees. And uh, these programs are jointly overseen by OMH and OASIS. And we're gonna be we're gonna be talking about four services today: the empowerment, uh, peer support, psychosocial rehabilitation family support and training and community psychiatric support and treatment. So let's take a little look at these one at a time. So the CPST, the Community Psychiatric Support and Treatment, it's really designed to provide mobile treatment services to individuals who have difficulty engaging in site-based programs uh, or who have not previously engaged in services and, and including those who have only partially benefited from traditional treatment. So what we're seeing here in the CPST is an emphasis on individuals who are hard to engage, moving services out into the community and really having the service uh, components of assessment, counseling, uh, integrated co-occurring disorder treatment, crisis prevention, and intensive rehab counseling. So you see some of the components that we have might you might see in a in a more of a traditional clinic model. But what we're what we're moving these into those individuals, those eligible individuals that have been difficulty engaging in traditional approaches. You'll see on the right hand, or my right hand of the screen is the services that are built. And, the, and all of our core services are gonna be built in 15 minute intervals. One of the key, I'm gonna be talking about some of the key differences in the, in the billing as it relates to services. So when we do the CPST, your billing rates are going to be determined by the credentials of the individuals who are providing the services. It's a, it's a little bit for those who have been providing more traditional types of services, it's a different approach. And you'll see that there'll be a rate for our physicians, there'll be a different rate for psychologists, physician assistants, and nurse practitioners. It'll be a different rate for your RNs, your LMHCs, um, and also your uh, other allow 
allowable professionals. So as we begin putting these programs up and we think, you know, in terms of configuring systems and billing systems, obviously a key component in CPST is understanding the credentials of the individuals providing the services because those credentials are going to drive the reimbursement rate you're going to be able to receive for these services. There's two other supplemental reimbursements that we're going to see in each component that really, in my mind, raises some operational challenges. So we have a travel supplement that's going to be paid on a per mile basis, or there can be a travel supplement paid on uh, if your staff is using public transportation. Now, the positive part of that is that there, there'll be reimbursement for you for the additional costs incurred for providing offsite services. The challenge comes in assuring compliance, assuring that, first of all, you're saying the example of mileage, that you're capturing the, pro the proper mileage from one location to the next, that you have proper documentation of that uh, because you're going to be billing through Medicaid for these travel supplements. And what is over going to overlay that is the normal um, kind of regulatory oversight or, uh, or compliant regulatory compliance that you need to overlay onto your billing systems. So we certainly applaud the ability to gain reimbursement for uh, our travel. Uh, be aware that you have to build your compliance piece around those uh, bills also. Let's go on to the next service we're gonna be talking about is psychosocial rehabilitation or PRS designed to assist individuals in improving functional abilities to the greatest degree possible in settings where they live, work, learn, and socialize. So again, we're a, we're a community, we're, we're looking towards a community-based model. We're gonna have the assessment and recovery planning, psychoeducation and skill building and rehabilitation counseling. When we look at the billing pieces, as we, we looked at our, our original bill, we were, we were billing, our rates were driven by credentials. Now we're moving in PRS to rates being determined by services and service type. So we have a psychosocial rehab where you'd be working with an individual. There'll be a rate for an on-site work. That same psycho psychosocial rehab individual will have a different rate for an offsite work. Now you're gonna do psychosocial rehabilitation if you're, if you're focusing on employment, that's gonna have an even higher rate. It's going, that rate is gonna be the same for education. That could be onsite or offsite. And then we have three different flavors of groups with reimbursement rates based upon if your group is two to three, if your group is four to five, or if your group is six to eight. So if we stop and we think, well, the last model we looked at was credential based. Now in this model, this is a very different sort of approach. You know, first of all, we have on-site, off-site for individual. Then we have a new rate for employment focus and education focus, but it's the same on-site or off-site. And then we have different rates per person per 15 minutes based upon your group size. And of course, there's the same supplemental payment. So as we think about, again, our systems and configuring our systems is certainly understanding on-site, off-site. Is it an employment focus? Is it education focus? How do the notes reflect that? What is the size of our group? So your billing systems then need to incorporate understanding what the service was provided, where it was provided, what the focus of the service was, and if it's a group, the group size. So yes, the, I'm, I'm walking through this because depending on which service, and if you you're going to provide the full range of services, then you need to take into consideration these kind of service mix 
pieces and assure that your systems are configured properly to pick up these nuances. And we're going to talk a little bit more about service mix as we move on and talk about revenue generation. So the family support and training, the FST, instruction, emotional support, skill building, uh, to facilitate engagement and active participation of families in the individual recovery process. Um, these, these services are gonna be person-centered or person-directed, recovery-oriented and trauma-informed. So the service components here, personal person-centered recovery planning, education, skill building and support. When we take a look at the billing, so now what are the flavors? Now we only have two flavors of that. One is family support and training individual, family support and training in a group of two or three. So you see now we're only dealing with two different reimbursement rates plus the supplemental reimbursement. This is a simpler model from the billing side, from the configuration side. And in this case, you don't, you, you need to understand if it's an individual or in a group, the differential rates and, and the number of people in your group. And the final service that we're going to talk about today is the empowerment services or peer support. These are non-clinical peer direct delivered services. They're going to focus on rehabilitation, recovery. Uh, they're really designed to promote skills for coping and managing behavioral health symptoms. Um, and really try to utilize, leverage, and enhance nat natural support services and community resources. So some of the components here are person-centered recovery planning, advocacy, support, activation and engagement in recovery, community participation, transitional support, pre-crisis and crisis support. And now we're at the simplest. We have 50, we're again billing in 15 minute increments as we're billing in all the other programs. We have, we have one type bill, a peer support service. We still have our travel supplement for both uh, per mile reimbursement or public transit reimbursement. So you see, as, as we work through these programs, uh, the sort of the, the structure and the infrastructure necessary to support the billing side, what you need to understand, it gets a little bit simpler as we move through this process. But each of these are important and we'll look at an example of how you should be thinking about some of, uh, of the components. So let's just sort of, that was just sort of a level set, give you a little bit flavor for some of the complexities as it relates to the revenue side. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, so let's jump in. So let's start with, you know, what are, what are best practice? Well, I talk about this a lot. Good financial planning recovers participation and contribution from executive leadership, program leadership, financial leadership, and operations and support. Let's dive into that a little bit more. I think a lot of times what I see in, in, in programs, they begin, you know, they're bringing up a new program, they're making a switch from HCBS to core, they're trying to build out and expand their program. Sometimes the, those, those responsibilities are siloed. Finance may be working on one piece, executive leadership may be engaged or they may not be engaged. Program leadership has the bulk of the responsibilities and <clears throat> bringing the program you may have operations piece of people who are working on the EMR, on the billing side. Uh, and I, I often find that organizations work in these sort of siloed environment. Everybody's in their own domain and they may come together from time to time, but, but it's not as robust of a, of a, of a working relationship when we're doing program development that I think is really necessary and critical. When we think about executive leadership, what, what you know, they're, they're really talking, of, they're, they're gonna make um, 
they're going to make decisions about what the organization is committing to. How important are these services within the service mix? Do they have to be self-sustaining out of the box? Can the or is the organization going to invest in infrastructure bill and build out bill? Um, what, how, what, where does these services fit in organizationally? And that's, that's an important starting point that really speaks to the resources that the organization is going to gonna dedicate to bring forward. That's an important piece. Program leadership, you're going to, we're going to, you're going to see as we talk through this, all kinds of decisions. Program leaders have, they have clinical outcome goals. That is, what are the, what are you striving for? What is important? And the decisions that you make about how you're gonna achieve your clinical outcome goals has a financial implication and a finance. And so the program leadership and financial leaderships have to work in concert because as you'll see, some of the clinical decisions we're gonna make are gonna have very powerful financial uh, ramification. So if executive leadership says these within 12 months, these programs have to be self-sustaining, then the financial leadership and the program leadership are going to create a program structure that, that can meet your clinical outcome goals, but meet those financial sustainability goals. And finally, operations needs to understand what's going on. They need to reconfigure um, the billing systems or the EMR systems. You may need new assessments or you may wanna tweak assessments. You have to grab mileage. You have to bring it into the system. You have to verify it. All these operations, you have a revenue cycle management. You may have data collection pieces. So you can't create a program that's going to be successful both financially, operationally, and clinically without a good working relationship from each of these um, areas. So I get off my soapbox and we'll talk a little bit about some of the key financial and operational considerations. So these are the kind, these are some of the variables that you're gonna see in the future when we, when we uh, publish the, the financial model, which is an Excel-based model. So this is sort of a precursor. This is to help you begin thinking about what information you need to hone in on. What should, what, what should you be thinking about? How do these different variables fit together? So let's start with volume. Volume, how many clients you can have on the rolls and how often you're gonna see them every month? What's the scope of your program? You know, Building a program where you think that you're going to have 100 clients, that you're gonna see individuals, you're gonna on average see those individuals three times a month. Well, that, that's a scope based upon number of clients and, and the number of times you're gonna see them. If it's only going to be 10 clients, you're going to see twice, but that's that's a whole different thing. So I, if you're running ACVS programs, you're doing the conversion to core, you have your data, you know what your volume is, you know what the scope is, uh, that's a good starting point. If you're trying to increase these programs, build these programs from scratch, then you really need to be able to have the starting point of estimating what your volume is going to be, which is going to change over time. The other is service mix. So when we looked at each of the different program components, they all they have different service mix. So and, and each of those different services have a different rate attached to them. So first you know have to know volume and then you have to know what are the services that we're gonna provide. You saw on the one that we had three flavors of groups. Well, you may say, well, we're not gonna provide groups. Um, we're only gonna do individual. Uh, but in, a, in the modeling that, that we'll be able to do later is to say, you could say, okay, what if we did a percentage of, of groups? Um, what if we did 10% of this flavor of group? What would the financial ramifications? Well, how would our revenue change? So service mix is an important variable because there are different rates attached to different services. So as you begin building out your budgets, building out your models, understanding what your service mix is going to look like is another key variable. 
Then, of course, there's what percentage of the services will be off-site, and how will you efficiently provide those services? I'm going to talk a little bit more explicitly about that a little bit later, but some of the services have an off-site rate versus a, a, an on-site rate. But where we're going to find the percentage of service off-site is going to have a significant effect on productivity. That is, so you're thinking about the logistics of providing off-site services in the most efficient fashion uh, will have an impact financially. But at the very beginning, you have to have a sense, you could say we're doing 100% services off-site. And then you begin building your program design. This is designed to be an off-site. You know, we're not gonna have brick and mortar. Well, if you're not gonna have brick and mortar, that's going to affect the costs that, that you're gonna allocate into the program. It's going to affect your efficiencies. It's going to have all kinds of ramifications. So you have to begin thinking about that. But then what type of uh, transportation will re you re reimburse and how long will average travel times be? So the reimbursement for travel is not insignificant. It's not a huge piece in the revenue generation, but it's a piece that you don't want to leave on the table. If you could build efficient infrastructure for getting that data in, then you can bill for, we want to be able to understand the impact of the revenue that you're going to be generating from that, and also the impact that it's going to have on productivity. And then this one goes without saying service duration, you bill out in 15 minute time blocks. So if we said, all right, we have a hundred clients in any one month, on average, we're going to bill those hundred clients for three visits. Well, is that three 15 minute visits? Is that three 45 minute visits? Is that three 60 minute visits? So the duration of your services, since your rates are in 15 minute intervals, your duration of your average duration of the services is going to be a primary driver in your revenue. And we'll look more closely at that. Those are the beginning phases of what are really the important variables as it relates to our, our, our financial model. There are other considerations we have to have is that staff type. Staff type in uh, CPST is important from the credentialing standpoint as it relates to revenue. But also when you're thinking about, so what we're seeing that's happening now, we saw this in the, in the children's, the CFTSS services, is that people are starting to use more and more fee-for-service staff. Uh, so a fee-for-service staff may have a different reimbursement rate. You may pay them only for completed services. You may have a lower fringe percentage rate related to that. It's a different, you may have a different productivity expectation for your fee-for-service than you have for your full-time staff. So we raised this to help you think about how are you going to utilize staff? What type of staff are you going to utilize? And what are the cost differentials that you may experience based on, and what are the different requirements that you're going to have based upon the staff type? And it has a financial ramification. I've mentioned productivity before. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. It's a critical element. How much supervisory time you're going to need. And sometimes you need different levels of supervision based, based upon the staff. So if you have a psychiatrist providing services in CPST, supervision may be none at all. Uh, if you have a peer providing peer support services, they're new, uh, they are not well um, accustomed to the kind of work environment that you have, your paperwork requirements, Maybe you have more supervisory time for that person as a requirement uh, of your supervisors and of the staff. We raise this as a financial uh, issue because your supervisors tend to be the highest paid clinical uh, individuals on your team. And so we have to take into consideration how much time and supervision we need to allocate to this program. 
And then what support staff will be allocated? People use all different kinds of ways of support staff. So, you know, are you going to need a certain amount of time from billing? Uh, are you going to need a certain amount of time from compliance or quality assurance? You're going to need a certain, you know, how does H, how is your human resources allocated? So how are you going to allocate? How are those non-clinical costs, non-program specific costs? How does your organization treat those costs and how much of those costs need to be brought into the program? I find a lot of programs don't have good cost allocation methodologies. So how are we going to determine how much billing costs are going to be in this program? And so those are the kind of considerations from the cost side. And the final is operating costs. If it's going to be 100% uh, in the field, are you going to allocate any uh, rent cost? Well, you have your supervisors, they have to live somewhere, you have your program coordinators, they're not going to work out of your car, but maybe that's only a half of an FTE. So how much of my rent costs am I going to bring in? How much of my, my utility costs, supplies, those kind of things? So these are the considerations as it relates to to revenue generation and to cost allocation. Let's talk a little bit about productivity. And, and the reason I'm spending a little bit more time on this is that um, it's the financial variability that has the greatest impact on financial sustainability. And when we talk about productivity, we use a percentage of billable to paid hours per full-time equivalent. So let me talk a little bit about that. So billable hours is normally something that's relatively easy to grab. Most systems, most billing systems have a, um, have a duration on a service, you're going to be billing in 15 minute blocks. So you're going to have to know what amount of time was provided at each intervention level. So what we do is we, we grab the hours that somebody was provided billable services, and we compare that to the total number of hours paid. So as an example, if you had a 35 hour work week, you are going to pay somebody 1,820 hours per year. If you expect them to be billing 60% of the time, then of that 820 hours, 1,092 hours, they're going to be billing. We don't back out PTO. We don't back out sick time. We don't back out vacations. We use a simple formula of this is what we paid you during this period. And this is the uh, 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 number of the hours that you provided billable services and we compare the two. And it's important is also because it, it's really simple. So productivity dictates the number of staff hours that will be required to provide a certain level of service. Lower productivity requires more staff hours. Higher productivity requires less staff hours. So staffing and staffing costs, salary and fringe benefits will make up over 70% of your program cost. And so this is, first of all, it's your highest level cost, staff, fringe benefits, salaries. It dictates based upon the volume that we talked about before, are you gonna provide X number of services for X amount of hours? How many staff are we gonna to need to do that? And that's where the productivity number comes in. Lower productivity, more staff required, more costs required to provide the same number of services. Higher productivity, then of course the you have less staff less cost and a bigger difference between your gross costs and your gross revenue 
Now, travel time in these community-based models eats into the ability to provide billable direct care hours. That must be taken into consideration when you're thinking about how you're going to provide the services. So some of the things we talk about with people is, all right, let's think about, we have, we have to be efficient. It's a logistical problem. Is that you can't have somebody report to the office, drive an hour or 45 minutes and you're in a rural program to see a client, come back to the office, go back out again, see somebody, come back to the office. You can't in a six hour or a seven hour day eat up 50% of that or 60% of that in travel time. Because what's going to happen is, is that you'll have low productivity, you'll need more staff to provide the same number of services, and you're going to have a higher gross cost per hour of service, which is then going to affect your financial sustainability. So one of the things we talk about, understand where your clients reside in your service delivery area. Do you have a concentration of clients? What, how, are you going to, how are you going to efficiently work with your clients who outlaw, are outliers outside of, of, um, of your population centers? You may wanna consider based upon where that client map is as of signing staff to geographic regions. So, you know, you don't want to have somebody going to the north part of your, your region and then and this later that day going to the south part. And you may want to say, if it works, okay, this individual works within this geographic region, shortening the travel time from each of the clients. Um, when possible, schedule clients on days and times that minimize staff travel. Other thing is considering allowing staff to start their day in the field. So they report to work at their first client. They don't have to come into the office. They don't have to travel back out. Um, you save some time there. And you know, you, it provides staff with secure technology to work in the field. They reduce the number of times they need to return to the office uh, during the workday. And there's a lot of models that are out there that um, really, and, uh, and much of the technology allows you to really access your EMR, do some of your note-taking. If you do concurrent documentation, you can do that with, with the individual you're working with in the field. So I just mentioned this because these, these, what we find is, is that the community-based models, there is a whole other set of variables that have to take into consideration and efficiency. How efficiently can you deploy your staff in the community to enhance the percentage of time that they can be spent in billing and decrease the percentage of the time that they're gonna be doing in travel? That's an important consideration. So let's put some of these things together. So let's first talk a little bit about the factors that determine revenue. And I've talked about some of these, but we're going to talk about these more specifically. So the number of clients and the frequency of visit. Again, scope. If I've got 100 clients and we're going to see them three times and I'm going to have uh, 300 visits. If um, of those 300 visits, the average amount of time we're going to spend on those 300 is uh, one hour each then I have a need for, I'm going to be providing 300 billable hours. Now the percentage of offsite. So if I have an offsite differential for those 300 billable hours and 50% of them are going to be offsite, then I'm going to have a little bit higher reimbursement rate for those percentage of offsite visits. Service mix, I'm doing 300 hours, but 250 hours are, are going to be reimbursed at this rate. 50 of hours are going to be reimbursed at this rate. Uh, so I have different rates. And of course, the, the rate structure is an important piece in the service duration that I mentioned. So your revenue is driven by volume, 
percentage of offsite visits in some cases, certainly your service mix and your service duration. So let's take a look at what that might look like in a more of an example. So uh, when I took on the left side here, we have revenue components. So here's the volume. We have an average number of billable services per month. It's 50. I'm going to see people three times per month. So I have 150 clients uh, or contacts per month or 1,800 contacts per year. So I've just def I de defined my scope. I have, we're looking at PRS here. I have a service mix and I think I'm going to do 12% of my services uh, in individual onsite. 38% of it's individual offsite and down. I'm going to do some groups. 10% of them are going to be two to four. So as we start with volume, scope, how many services? What's the mix look like on a percentage level? Because it's going to have different rates. So then what's the average service duration? Well, we think that psychosocial rehab individual is going to be 45 minutes on average, psychosocial rehab, employment, or education is gonna be 45, and our groups are gonna be 60 minutes. And 75% of them are going to be offsite, and here's the rates. The rates are, these are the upstate rates, 1989 for rehab individual, and you can see those there. So we have volume, we have service mix, average dur duration, offsite visits. If we look over on the calculated side, what do we see? We've taken all these factors into consideration and we know that we're going to do 216 contacts of uh, psychosocial rehab individual on site. Those are gonna be provided for 45 minutes. So in my rate per hour, 79.56. So I know how many services, I know how many service hours, I know what the rate is gonna be for that. So I can estimate the revenue and I'm gonna estimate the revenue at 18,000. So you see, and so I'm gonna do 18,000 for my individual on site, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do 72,000 for my individual off site. Why is that? I'm gonna do 38% of my total units off site. And so that's going to drive a larger dollar value as it relates to your revenue. So that's why it's important that we understand volume. That's going to tell us the hours. Uh, that's going to tell us the contacts. Service mix. That's going to help us drive the, to, towards the reimbursement rates. The average amount. So now we know what we're going to collect for uh, on average for each of these services and the offsite differential because we have an offsite differential rate. So you'll see each of these services has returns a different dollar amount at the revenue side. So I'm hoping what I'm trying to, to help convey here is that each of these components, volume, service mix, duration, percentage offsite and rates have an important uh, are important to properly projecting and calculating out what your revenue is going to be. You can't just mash these all together. The rates are too different. You know, 1989 for a, um, an on-site individual is very different from a 2610 for an employment or education both uh, focused visit. So here's the, the, the components I talked about and how they come together as it relates to revenue generation. So- David, there's a, there's a question. Sure. Um, Megan um, asks, um, am I understanding this correctly where it breaks down to 37.5 billable clients per week? I'm looking back at your thirty-seven point five clinical billable clients per week. Well, if we have one hundred and fifty, so these are contacts. So this actually says what we have is in this case, 
we have 50 billable clients. So what we have is 150. So if you divided that 150 by four, that would be the number of billable hours that we would be generating in a week. And the 50 uh, could probably move in and out. I mean, so we have to have to take this a little bit offline and think about this for a second. Um, well, maybe we can come back to it to the end, end yeah. of the session. Okay. That if that's okay, fine. Megan, thank you for your question. Uh, staffing. All right, so what do we talk about? Staffing is going to drive 70%, 72%, 78% of your cost. If you're a governmental unit, it will be driving even more percentage of that cost. So staffing. So we start with number of clients and frequency of visits. Again, volume. We need to know uh, what our volume is going to be. Service mix. Again, we're going to need to understand what our service mix is, the number and the type of clients that we're going to need. We're going to need to know what your work week, you're going to, you know what your work week is, but we have to incorporate work week into the financial model. As an example, is if, if your work week is 35 hours per week, each of your individual employee is going to be paid 1,820 hours. And if you have 60% productivity value, then you're going to get uh, 1,092 hours of billing from that one person. If you have a 40 hour work week, you're going to be paying somebody 2,080 hours, and you're going to have 1,248 billable hours for that individual in a week. It's a 14% difference. So work week is a, is a critical factor. in when you do your modeling, we talked about program productivity, and we talked about service dura duration. Let's take a look at what that calculation would look like. Same volume, same service mix, same average duration. Now we've added in our productivity at 60%. We have a work week of 35 point hour, 5.0. So what does that mean? We do the same calculation on the service mix size. And what we've determined in both of these, the analysis I did before to drive revenue and the analysis we're doing now to determine your staffing configuration is I need to provide, as you'll see, 1,485 hours of service. We go through the same calculation. We need the same variables. So I have a 37.5 hour work week I have an annual hours per full-time equivalent of 1950. My productivity is 60%. So from every individual full-time equivalent, I'm going to expect 1,170 billable hours. I'm going to, I'm, I'm estimating I'm going to provide 1,485 hours of service. How many staff does it take? to do that. It takes, I, I need 1.67 staff. I take the 1,170 hours that each of my full-time equivalents is going to generate in billable time. I divide that into the number of billable hours that I'm estimating that I need to staff up to. And that tells me I need 1.67 staff. So what I've done is I've, I've generated my revenue expectations. I've calculated my staffing needs. And then what's left? Well, it's cost. What are the average staff salaries? What's the number of staff I need? We just did that. What are my operating costs are going to be? What's my overhead allocation? What's my fringe benefit percentage going to be? So let's bring those things together. My average cost for direct care staff is 42. Support staff is 50. I got fringe benefits of 28%. We calculated that I need 1.67 direct care staff. I'm going to say I'm going to need probably a third, a little bit more of a third of a support staff. On my, I've done my cost allocation models. I'm going to allocate about $19,500. My ANOH is 13%. I'm going to calculate what my staff costs are going to be what my program costs are going to be, 
and what my administrative overhead costs are going to be, and then what my total costs are going to be. And we bring this together and it's going to cost, I'm predicting, it's going to, for the type of service that I'm going to provide. So to provide 50 clients with on average three contacts per month, it's going to cost 88,000 in salary, 24 in fringe. My operating will be 19. Administrative will cost me 150. Based upon the variables in the productivity that I set up, um, I've got estimated revenue of 150,000 and I'm going to make $2 in this program. And that my cost of service is going to be 101.01 and 101.15. So what I'm trying to show here is, is that what we do is we go through a series of steps. We have information that's necessary for us to accurately calculate revenue. We have information that is necessary for us to accurately calculate the direct care staffing requirements based upon our volume, our service mix, our productivity, and our average duration. So we can do, then we have our other costs that we have to bring in. And when we put those all together, we have a model that generates your expenses, your revenues, and your surplus and loss and your sustainability. That was a lot in a relatively short period of time. So Chris, what we're going to do is I'm going to, um, Meg is gonna jump in and talk a little bit about some of the upcoming. And did we have questions that- We do, we've got, okay. we've got, we've got two or three there now. That okay, so let's, let's uh, let Meg right. run through this quick and then we'll jump into our questions. So I'll just recognize there's one overarching question I think that's been asked is about where does transportation fit into this metric? And uh, I think it, that's sort of an overarching question for that applies to all of these outreach services, David, if you want to handle that one first. Yeah, well, that's why let's let Meg go through these first and then we'll jump okay. over to, right. okay. I'll go through this quickly because I know that transportation question is a burning one. I've seen it pop up quite a bit. So thank you, David, for kind of walking us through all of that and Chris for facilitating the questions that did come in. I hope my audio is okay. I've tried to reposition my headphone. Um, but just very quickly, I wanted to just make sure everyone who was joining us today for the webinar was familiar with some upcoming offerings we've announced that you can register for. So I mentioned that we have not only partnered with CCSI on these core implementation offerings, but also with our partners at NIAPERS. And so our dear partner, Daniela, will be joining us and leading us for the next two live webinars that are coming up in early May, um, how core service practitioners can work alongside others to support people in meeting their goals, and then working together how bundling core services can support HARP members, which is in mid-May. So we want to encourage you to register if you haven't already for those webinars. You can do so by visiting the MCTAC website, clicking on our calendar, and you can register pretty quickly that way. Um, we're excited about those upcoming webinars and hope you'll join us for them. And then additionally, earlier, oops, sorry, David, could you go back one more slide? Sorry, <laughs> thank you. Um, earlier, I mentioned that our core implementation offerings are all part of this kind of comprehensive package. And what David walked us through today is really gonna tie in nicely with this fabulous financial calculator core tool that he's developed. So we're hoping to launch that in mid-June. Get excited, it's coming in June. Um, and along with that, there will be a companion guide that Chris is really working hard on developing. Um, and along with that, there's going to be a webinar that kind of walks through the tool, helps you understand how to utilize it. And then there's gonna be an office hours. So our hope is that we'll release the tool, you'll get a look at it, we'll have our webinar, and I think the webinar is gonna be in mid-June, that's what we're aiming for. And then after the webinar, after you've had a moment to look at the tool, check it out, test it out, review the webinar, we're gonna have a live office hour where David and Chris will be present that you can ask their questions. Um, so if there's any questions that you have as you go through this new tool that will be released later this spring, it's not out there yet, um, you can join us on the webinar and kind of ask David and Chris your questions then. 
all of what I just reviewed very quickly, I know I'm talking quickly because I'm looking at the time, can be found on the MCTAC website. We have a core implementation page that you can visit where all of this information can be found. David, if you want to go to the next slide quickly. Thank you. Along with the MCTAC core implementation page, we wanted to make sure you were aware of all of these pages that had really important resources. Um, thank you, Nadej, for chatting that all out to everybody in the chat box. So if you're looking for information, you can visit the state's OMH's core website. We have that listed here. We have our special initiatives page listed here. And then we specifically list some very important resources that the state has issued around the operations manual for core, billing guidance, and whatnot. So I will leave you there because I know there are questions that you might have um, up for David in the time that remains. And I just, again, want to thank our, our partners, David and Chris, for joining us and presenting today, and all of you for asking, asking these questions. So Chris and David, I, okay. I give it back to you. Chris, you want to restate that question quick? Yes, yeah, so simply what is the, where does transportation fit into the, the model? Um, uh, how do you, I guess, how do you account for the time? Well, like yeah, there's a, there's, when we do the modeling, we'll, we'll talk about travel. I mean, first of all, travel is reimbursed. So there's, there's revenue related to that. Yeah. So, but travel time is, um, is factored into the model really as it relates to productivity, because if I'm working seven out, 7.5 hours a day, the amount of time that I'm traveling reduces the amount of time that I'm providing billable services. And so it's really, as we talk about what of the, it's a logistical problem. One of the key aspects of your thinking is how do you provide a community-based model that reduces as much as possible the amount of time that your staff have to spend in travel. Because if we say we want them billing 60% of the time, then there's just a certain number of hours in a day that they could be traveling. If you said 50%, then there's a little bit more time for travel. So we think about travel time as an important component as it relates to the amount of billable services each staff can provide. And those amount of number of billable services dictate the number of staff that you need, your costs, and how much revenue you'll generate. You're on mute, Chris, by the way. I'm on mute. Apologies. We're just on talking. mute. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I was just chatting to somebody about my accent. So um, I, I'm not, not sorry about that. Um, <laughs> so question, let me see if I can, I'll just read this out. In the PSR revenue model, how do you address a client who receives a mixture of types of service delivery, I offsite and onsite? And I wonder whether this is going to be more, that question is going to be more answered when we do the financial modeling tool later this uh, later in the yeah. Summer. So the the modeling tool goes runs on averages. So we don't drive this down to an individual client. So as this again, we have fifty clients, and they're averaging three visits per month. But it could be we determine what that mix is going to be. So. This client one week could have an on-site individual and the next week they could have an employment or an education focus. From the modeling side, it does not matter at the individual client level because what we're doing is we're taking averages and we basically, if you have the data, you go back and take a look at your data and you begin building these percentages out. So the model does not require you to drive it down to the individual staff level or individual client level. And just this last question, I think just to clarify the 50 clients, the, the, the billable service per month. So the question is, um, does one staff member have a caseload of 50? And no, this is really... A number of client and a, a clients the program has, right? And they, and they calculate to um, helps you decide how many staff you need to deliver those services based on productivity right. and the frequency of visits. Absolutely, and those are 
those are not, these are not caseloads. These are number of clients that you anticipate billing on average billing for in any one month. Caseloads are difficult in, as a metric in this because it's, it's, you know, on a caseload, it's somebody you may not be working with somebody, they're not, but they're not disenrolled and they're still on caseloads and that gets a little bit messy. So this is sort of an average. So one of the things we have to change a little bit of our thinking is to move back and we're, we're modeling at, at a program level against averages. It's a, it's a predictive tool. Uh, that then just needs to be updated as reality hits. And I do see that we're at time. Oh, and according to my clock, we're a minute over. So I, a last thing I'll say is those guidance documents, read them and then review them and then read them again uh, because they will really drive your understanding and help with your modeling. What I talked about and looked at today are components of the financial model. This is a precursor. Join us when we announce that. Take a look at the tool. Join us for that. You'll get hand, we'll do hands on work with you to better understand. But what I was hoping to do today was to orient you to the drivers, to the things you should be thinking about as you move this forward. So thank you again for joining us. Um, and thank you, Chris. Thank you, Meg. Thank you for our partners uh, at MCTEC and NIAPERS. And we'll hope to be talking with you again um, in a month or so. So take care, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, David. Thank you, Chris.